morning. You may be seated. Welcome. It's so good to have you with us this morning. What a great place to be on a Sunday morning. We're absolutely blessed to have the opportunity to gather up with God's people and to celebrate who Jesus is, to spend some time in worship and uh, have some anticipation and expectation that God might move among his people even in this moment. I know I say it every week, I'm going to say it again this week. I believe God speaks to us in a lot of different ways, and one of those ways would be in prayer, of course, and through reading His Word. We're going to talk about that in the message today. But uh, also interacting with God's people and also in worship. When we worship, we have an opportunity for God to speak to us, and so we should expect that and anticipate it and prepare our hearts for that very thing, that God would speak to us. So I want to share Scripture with you and pray with you so that we can do that very thing. Uh, I'm going to read to you the, uh, from the CSB translation, Psalm 95, verses 1 to 7. Come, let us shout joyfully to the Lord. Shout triumphantly to the rock of our salvation. Let us enter his presence with thanksgiving. I hope we've done that this morning. Let us shout triumphantly to him in song. For the Lord is a great God, a great king above all gods. The depths of the earth are in his hand and the mountain peaks are his. The sea is his, he made it. His hands formed the dry land. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker. For he is our God and we are the people of his pasture, the sheep under his care. Let's pray. Lord, we come together in agreement and we have gathered up in your holy name. Would you now prepare our hearts for worship? Father, would you give us clean hands and pure hearts and, and would you set aside all the distractions outside these four walls, all those things which might pull away our attention from you and your word. Father, we've gathered up to rejoice in you, you who are the rock of our salvation. Father, I pray that we have entered this place and come into your presence with thanksgiving for you are great and you are God and, and we don't deserve that you would even acknowledge us and you do so much more. You want a personal relationship with each one of us. Father, would you speak to us now as we worship you? Would you speak to us as we bring you the offering of our praise? We welcome your presence. We welcome the power of your Holy Spirit surging among your people, even in this moment. And Father, we pray this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen.
Heavenly Father, thank you for your presence in this place this morning. Thank you for the opportunity to worship you, to be in your presence, to sing your praise. Thank you that no battle is too big for you, Lord. We praise you this morning. We thank you. So in your name we pray. Amen. All right, would you pray with me? Father, would you help me to deliver your message this morning? Please set aside my personality and, and give me the courage to say what needs to be said. I pray this message is 100% yours, not mine, that your Holy Spirit will speak through me. Father, would you speak to all of us now? Father, would you help us to allow our hearts and minds to just be so filled with your word that the truth will stay fresh in our hearts? And I pray this, Lord, in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. All right, our main text today is Psalm 119, verses 9 to 16. The 119th Psalm, verses 9 to 16, is, with today's message, Keeping Our Way Pure, as we continue our study of the 119th Psalm in our sermon series titled, Delight in God's Word. According to a 2013 American Bible Society survey, more than half, uh, 77% in fact, more than half of Americans at the time when they did the survey, 2013, uh, thought the Bible had too little influence on a culture they saw in moral decline. Yet, in the very same survey, they found that only one in five Americans read their Bible on a regular basis. 88% um, of the Americans surveyed said they owned a Bible. 80% said they thought the Bible is sacred. 61% said they wish they read their Bible more. Also, the average American household surveyed had 4.4 Bibles in their home. 
Um, the survey showed of those who read their Bible, the majority of those who read their Bible, 57% only read their Bible four times a year <laughs> or less, four times or less a year. Uh, only 26% said they read their Bible on a regular basis four or more times a week. Uh, the Barna Group, another group who does surveys, among other things, they conduct an annual State of the Bible survey. And their 2020 survey was their 10th annual survey, been doing 10 years, 10 years in a row. And it indicated that people were actually reading their Bible less during the pandemic. Uh, the number of American adults who are engaged with their Bible based on how frequently they read Scripture and its impact on their day-to-day -day dropped from 28% to 23% in 2020. The drop coinciding with the beginning of the pandemic. They all, uh, the survey also showed that in 2020, 35% of the Americans surveyed never read their Bible. 35% never read it, which is up 10% from 25% the year before. Uh, or at, at, at the beginning, the 10 years prior. So in 2011, when they started, it was 25%. 2020, it was 35%. There's a lot of numbers. Should have put those on the screen. In the U.S., we have greater access to the Bible uh, than anywhere else on the earth and greater access than at any other time uh, in the history of the world. But the data shows us that access to the Bible does not equal engagement just because we have access to it. And, and God is a gentleman with himself, with his son, with his Holy Spirit, with his word. None of it will be forced upon anybody. Um, we make a choice about whether or not uh, we will chase after God's biblical standard uh, and, uh, by being good students of God's word. We, we choose whether to do that or not. Listen, can I just tell you something? The 100, if the 119th Psalm, if it shows us anything at all, it shows us that God's word ought to be given a priority above all other things in our lives. Um, the overall message of the 119th Psalm focuses on the truth the truth of God's word. It encourages to stay, to stay close to and to stay focused on God's word no matter what comes in the way of circumstances in our lives. Uh, the 119th Psalm shows us how living in the freedom uh, and in the knowledge of God's word, obeying his uh, biblical standard, his commandments, um, is the only way, it, the only way, to live out our calling and God's purpose for creating us. Um, so hopefully, now that's kind of uh, cleansed the palates of our hearts and minds just a little bit, limbered things up, and let's dive into this study where the psalmist tells us, happy are those who walk according to God's word. Um, remember, the Bible is more than information. It, uh, it is truth to be obeyed. This is not an ordinary book. This is it's more than words. It's truth to be obeyed. This is medicine for our soul. Jesus said, if you continue in my word, then you are my disciples. He says, uh, you know, you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. Um, he also said, those who hear and keep the word of God are blessed. Jesus said that. This book has the power to transform us, so we should expect transformation. We should anticipate transformation when we get in this thing and roll around in it. Um, good students of God's word look for the truth so they can have a plan for what they're going to do different as a result. So let's, let's do that. I'm going to read to you from the CSB uh, Bible translation, and I have the privilege of reading to you Psalm 119 verses 9 to 16. How can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping your word. I have sought you with all my heart. Don't let me wander from your commands. I have treasured your word in my heart so that I may not sin against you. Lord, may you be blessed. Teach me your statutes. With my lips, I proclaim the judgments from your mouth. I, replace, I rejoice in the way revealed by your decrees in it as much in, as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and think about your ways. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. This is the word of the Lord. Keeping our way pure. The core message of uh, Psalm 119 is that those who are faithful ought to purpose in their hearts and commit to themselves to being good students of God's word. That's the core message of this whole chapter. Uh, more than just reading... More than even just memorizing words, but reading, studying, meditating on, and praying over the truth of God's word. 
We launched this new sermon series last week, Delight in God's Word, which in the CSB translation, that's the heading over this whole chapter, Delight in God's Word. And so if you missed last week, uh, this chapter is an acrostic poem uh, where each section or uh, eight-verse stanza uh, of this psalm begins with a Hebrew letter, the next Hebrew letter in the Hebrew alphabet. Uh, there are 22 eight-verse stanzas in this uh, chapter 119 of Psalms, and of course there are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. By the way, Hebrew is written from right to left. You're right to left, there we go, instead of left to right like we do English. Uh, in most other languages. Uh, the first section we looked at last week began with the Hebrew letter Aleph, okay? The first letter, Hebrew alphabet. So now it's this week, second section. Our uh, text today begins with the second letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and it's Bet. Now it's sometimes pronounced Bet, like B, Bet, or V, Vet, or somewhere in between. It's kind of the same way we sometimes pronounce the letter C, like the first C in circus. And sometimes it's the second C in circus, so it's bet. Uh, in our text today, in the second stanza of Psalm 119, a main point or lesson for us is that the Word of God can purify our lives, um, thus keeping our way pure. And keeping our way pure is, is done by keeping our life um, in line with God's Word. Um, so I asked a similar question last week, but so I'll ask you this week. How many of you know that you cannot keep your life in line with God's word by accident? That doesn't happen by accident. We must purpose in our hearts to do it, and God won't force it upon you. We must also delight in God's word. Um, we must have uh, be in love with God's word. Uh, and I believe God prompted me last week um, to caution you when I said, if you can't say, if you cannot say that you are in love with God's word, first of all, that's a big old red flag regarding your spiritual condition. It requires some attention ASAP, right? I'd start with talking to God about it and asking for his help about why it is that you're not in love with his word. Second, I can promise you this, you're missing out on a level of fellowship with God, which cannot be achieved any other way if you can't say you're in love with God's word. And I'll add a third this week. Don't expect to be keeping your way pure if you're not in love with God's word. Because if you're not in love with it, then you're not going to be a good student of it. You can't keep your life in line with God's word if you don't know what it says. Um, our text tells us we make our way pure by obeying God's word. So as I studied this passage last week, three things began to stand out to me. Number one, our way is made pure by God's word. Straight out of the chute, the psalmist uh, poses a question and then answers his own question. Uh, verse 9, how can a young man keep his way pure by keeping your word? And he's talking to God. Now, of course, we're going to generalize that and we're, we're going to say that young man, that applies to all ages, men and women. But note that it does say young man. And honestly, though, maybe keeping your way pure is most difficult for young adults. Um, in today's language, we might ask the question in a different way. We might say, okay, how do I avoid these youthful sins? Um, now that I'm an adult and, and no longer under the watchful eye of my parents, how do I get rid of these ridiculous bad habits? But we can all ask ourselves the same question, um, which is absolutely an important question. How can I keep my way pure? As true disciples and genuine followers of Jesus, we're called to choose the pure way. And then we're called to walk in it after we've chosen it. And the truth is, we're living in, more accurately, drowning in um, an ocean of impurity. Everywhere we look, we're tempted to live impure lives. I did some counseling last week with a young fellow. Um, his marriage is in real trouble, probably over. It doesn't look good. And they're both young. They're barely even adults. Um, haven't been married that long. And it really looks like she just wasn't ready for the grown-up life. You know, where, where you work and you pay bills and you mow the yard and you cook supper and you take out the trash and then you rearrange the furniture and you do it all over again. 
But the biggest problem is that neither one of them uh, has really made any effort whatsoever to honor God with their lives. I mean, that's the reality, to study His Word, you know, let alone to attempt to choose the pure way and then to live in it. Now, shocker, their marriage is falling apart. And neither one of them's happy and one of them's gone home to mama. The choices are sometimes difficult and life's not easy. Nobody ever said it was going to be. So the truth is that most people aren't willing to ask themselves the question, how can I keep my way pure? You see, it's a bit, the question's a bit troubling because sometimes we're thinking, how am I supposed to keep my way pure when I'm living in this filthy world? This is where God's word comes in, you see. Um, and the power of his Holy Spirit as we allow him to work in and through us and to guide our steps. Uh, by the way, I mentioned earlier the surveys. They also showed a much higher percentage of people who are fully engaged in their Bible when they're also fully engaged in some kind of community of faith. Yeah, not just warming a spot on a pew on Sunday morning. The survey showed those who were fully engaged, not just attending, but also serving in church life or small group or some other kind of community of faith uh, ministry. That group of people had a much higher number of folks who study their Bible, who are in love with God's Word. But how am I supposed to stay pure when I'm living in a filthy world? The psalmist tells it it is done by reading and studying God's Word and doing what it says. That's how. I mean, that's the simple answer. You can have the best smartphone money can buy, right? You can have five bars of 5G cell signal. You can fire up that GPS with a current map on it. You can get yourself some detailed instructions on how to get from point A to point B. And guess what, church? Let me just tell you something. You better believe you can still get lost if you don't follow the instructions, right? How can I keep my way pure? I don't have to tell you that soap and water and deodorant are three essential elements. Soap, water, and deodorant, three essential elements uh, of cleanliness and personal hygiene. Everybody know that, right? Yeah. Those who neglect those three things, what do they do? They get dirty and smelly, don't they? And, and they quickly become unacceptable to those people who are around them. Um, we've all known somebody with that problem, right? Uh, some of them, I mean, they, they might be sitting next to you on a pew right now. We don't know. But we've all known somebody with the problem. And sometimes after a while, they start to smell like maybe they're using vinegar for cologne, right? It can get gross. Listen, the same thing happens in the Christian life. Christians who neglect God's word, they start to get dirty and smelly. And they begin to look and smell like the world. They're no longer suited for the kind of sweet fellowship with God and with other believers which true disciples and genuine followers of Jesus uh, are able to enjoy freely. I'm not saying it's not available, but they're not able to enjoy that sweet spot the way you are when you're spending time in God's Word. Get ready because I'm about to offend somebody. Um, somebody's going to get offended. Somebody's not going to like what I'm about to say. I saw in the news where Caitlyn Jenner, formerly known as Bruce Jenner, is now running for governor of California. And personally, I will not be surprised if he wins. Why not select somebody who suffers with the very public mental health issue of gender dysphoria? And you see, I'm certain there will be Christians and even whole churches who will not only support him in that, but actually celebrate that idea. And I submit that that will be in part because they don't read their Bibles. There, I said it. Christians who neglect God's word get dirty and smelly and they begin to look like and smell like the world. Church, I believe there's going to come a time in the near future when I could get arrested for saying what I just said. But let me just tell you something. Bring it on. Because, you see, I'm trying to allow God's word to make my way pure. 
When you're willing to be a good student of God's word, willing to commit to honor God and his ways, no matter what the world says, his cleansing power is able to work in and through you to make your way pure. And this book hasn't changed, right? The psalmist makes a confession. It's an example we ought to all be following. Uh, Verse 10 says, I've sought you with all my heart. Don't let me wander. From your commands. Number one word I see there is heart. Heart. Heart's what distinguishes the living from the dead, right? Um, Let me ask you this. How could you experience more of the abundant life God has in mind for you as a child of God? How could you do that? Well, the answer is by seeking him with your whole heart. Verse 10, I have sought you with my whole heart. Verse 11, I have treasured your word in my heart. Last week it was verse 2. Happy are those who, number one, keep his decrees. Number two, seek him with all their heart. Now, that verse 11 there, uh, I have treasured your word in my heart. What do you reckon would be the purpose of that? To treasure his word in your heart. I submit that... um, When a statement like that is real, and it's not just words, it has great impact on our lives. You see, our thoughts, our will, and our desires in our human condition, they're enemies of God and the ways of God. Let me say that again. Our thoughts, our will, our desires in our human condition, they are enemies of God unless God's word is treasured in your heart. You see, that's just half of verse 11. Let's read the whole thing. I have treasured your word in my heart. Why? So that I may not sin against you. Listen, what God is teaching us here through the psalmist is simple. Treasuring God's word in your heart, it's a deterrent to sin in your life. You're having trouble with sin in your life? Get into his word. That fact alone, it ought to be inspiration and motivation to memorize Scripture. But we can't stop there because memorization alone is not going to keep us from sinning. We've got to also purpose in our hearts to put God's work, uh, God's word to work in our lives. We've got to commit ourselves to using this book, using the truths that are in this book as a guide for everything in our day to day. So as I studied this passage Last week, I see three things that stand out to me. Number one, our way is made pure by God's word. Number two, we're blessed by God's word. We're blessed by it. Verse 12 says, uh, Lord, may you be blessed. Teach me your statutes. The psalmist blesses God for all which he will teach. God is blessed and we're to allow God, uh, with, uh, to, we're to follow God to, uh, with the goal of being more like God, Right? So we cannot become more like God without studying his word. And we are blessed by God's word. This is a biblical truth. We're blessed by it. Another biblical truth is that ignorance of God's word, uh, it will not lead us to blessedness. We don't get blessed by being ignorant of God's word. There's no excuse. That's not an excuse. Uh, next time you get pulled over for a speeding uh, Tell the officer you didn't know what the speed limit was. See if it works. It probably won't. Maybe it will if you're, real, you're giving puppy dog eyes. God's biblical standard for living, it's a positive thing. It's a positive standard. Because it helps us to live in ways which uh, not only please God, right? That's part of it. But also it blesses. It blesses us. It ble- we talked about this in Sunday school. The blessing we get from obeying God. Look, one of the ways in which we can show our gratitude Uh, to God for sending his son to rescue and to restore us is by making every attempt to live according to his biblical standard for living. Verse 13 challenges us to not keep God's word to ourselves. It says, with my lips I proclaim all the judgments from your mouth. When God reveals his truth to us through his word, We are to share with those people who God places in our path uh, in order to encourage other believers or to shine a light into a dirty, smelly world. 
And listen, when we speak the truth of God's word as he has revealed to us, the power of God's Holy Spirit speaks to us. It's not just us talking. So we don't have to jazz it up. We don't have to exaggerate it. We don't have to make Jesus seem warm and fuzzy or to be concerned about the listener's response because that's not our problem. That's God's problem. God's truth is the truth regardless of who does or does not believe it. That part doesn't matter. It's still the truth. Notice the value placed by the psalmist on what God reveals uh, through his word. Verse 14, I rejoice in the way revealed by your decrees as much as in all riches. He compares the value of God's word to the value of all riches. Right? Some of us are getting old enough. Um, we might no, no longer be willing to bend over to pick up a penny, <laughs> right? Okay, it's me. I'm, I'm not willing to bend over to pick up a penny. I tell my kids to pick up that penny. But chances are, if it was a dollar bill or maybe a $20 bill, we'd bend over and pick that up, wouldn't we? It might take us a minute to get bent over and stood back up again. Meanwhile, we're over here ignoring uh, God's treasure chest full of truth. Maybe it's a man thing, but most of us don't like rules. It's a very uh, American to be uh, independent-minded, right? We don't like people to boss us around or tell us what to do. Meanwhile, the psalmist is over here rejoicing in God's biblical standard. Rejoicing in being provided instruction for living. Rejoicing in being blessed immeasurably, all riches as a result. One problem for some of us is that we look at God's word like it's a big rule book and we have to follow all the rules instead of like a treasure chest loaded with goodness. There's a great blessing to be found in God's word, a blessing which is revealed when we make God's word a priority. We give it priority. We choose that it will have greater priority than other things. I told you that as I studied this passage last week, there were three things that began to stand out to me. One, our way is made pure by God's word. Number two, we are blessed by God's word. Number three, we're delighted by God's word. Jane Overstreet last week talked about Psalm 37, 4, as she shared her testimony at the end of the service uh, and about God's word working in her life. Psalm 37, 4 says, Take delight in the Lord, He'll give you your heart's desires. And Jane shared how God had taught her the same lesson He taught me uh, a lot of years ago. That verse doesn't mean that all your wishes come true. It means take delight in the Lord and He will give you the desires He wants you to have. He will give you the desires He wants you to desire. Here's the deal. If you think about it, you know this is true. What delights us will capture our attention. Cause us to think about it and meditate on it. You, our beautiful, loving, caring church family, gifted Susan and I with an opportunity to take a trip. And we're leaving next Saturday for a week in Cancun. We're super excited and very blessed to have that opportunity. I can assure you, this upcoming trip has captured our attention. Uh, uh, we're thinking about it and meditating about how it's going to be a week on the beach. Listen, reading uh, the Bible is vital for us as Christians. How can anybody ever expect to learn about God or to grow in maturity spiritually without spending quality time in God's Word? How could that be? How can we expect God's word to capture our attention if we don't spend time in the book which God makes himself known? Listen, this is pretty important. We got to get this. If you don't get anything else today, get this. We're all full of excuses and we can all justify why we didn't make time this day or that day for spending some time in God's word. But listen, nothing, Nothing in our Christian life ought to have a greater priority than studying God's Word. Nothing. 
Not because uh, I was spending so much time in prayer, I didn't have time to read my Bible. Not because I was so busy serving other people. Not because I was so busy down at the Chick-fil-A eating the Lord's chicken with my Jesus t-shirt on. Not because we're all in the middle of a COVID-19 Panda Express. Listen, nothing ought to have a greater priority in our lives than Bible time. Nothing. Nothing. And this would be a good time when somebody would say, Amen. Amen. Oswald Chambers started his Friday daily devotion with this. He said, Before, uh, Beware of any work for God which enables us uh, to evade. Let me just start over. <laughs> Beware of any work for God which enables you to evade concentration on Him. A great many Christian workers worship their work. The one concern, the one concern of a worker should be concentration on God. And this will mean that all other margins of life, mental, moral, spiritual, are free with the freedom of a child. A worshiping child, not a wayward child. The way you concentrate on God is you learn more about Him and you do that through His book. Right? In order for that book to capture our attention... We got to be delighted by it. And if you're not delighted by God's word, talk to God about it and ask him for that delight in his word. If you're not delighted by God's word, do as the psalmist said, take delight in the Lord himself and he will give you your heart's desires. One of the desires God's heart, of God's heart is that we would be delighted by his word. That we would be delighted to take full advantage of the great value of His Word. The importance of spending much time with something of great value and beauty is illustrated by this story I read in an article in National Geographic magazine about a fellow named Carl Sharsmith. Carl Sharsmith was an 81-year-old tourist guide at Yosemite National Park where he'd worked for over 50 years. Carl told about the day, uh, a time a lady tourist asked him a question. She said, I've only got an hour to spend at Yosemite. What should I do and where should I go? This was his answer. Only an hour, eh? I suppose that if I only had an hour to spend at Yosemite, I'd just walk over there by the river and sit down and cry. <laughs> Can I just tell you something? I mean, I suppose it's a bit obvious. But a whole lifetime would not be long enough to fully appreciate uh, fully the beauty and, uh, of, and learning and value of God's Word. That's why we've got to take the little time that we have to study this treasure chest of truth uh, and to make those treasures true in our lives. Let's wrap this thing up. Is reading the Bible a necessary part of your day? Or does it have a low priority in your life? What are the things that can happen on a regular basis in your life which will lead you to not take time that day to read your Bible? And what could you do about it? Do you want to know how to face the problems of your day-to-day? -day? Do you want to know how to care less about your circumstances and more about God and the things of God? Do you want to know uh, what God wants you to do with your life uh, the way... Uh, you do that is by spending time in his word. Church, I, I believe God's challenging us today to give his word a greater priority in our lives. And listen, one thing's for sure. If we're too busy to read God's word, we're too busy. Another thing is this. Those who only ever sample God's word, they never really develop much of a taste for it. Verses 15 and 16 show us how we develop that delight in God's word. We're to meditate on it. We're to think about it. The psalmist wrote, I will meditate on your precepts and I will think about your ways. I will delight in your statutes and I will not forget your word. Let's pray. Father, we praise your holy name. We thank you for Jesus and for the power of your Holy Spirit. Father, thank you for the truth and hope and promise of your word. Thank you that you've written this book to us and for providing us with a biblical standard for living. Father, thank you for the challenge to give your word a greater priority in our lives. 
Lord, would you give us the courage to accept this challenge? And as we do, would you speak to us in a powerful way and reveal yourself to us in deeper ways over the coming days? Lord, would you give us a delight or a greater delight in you and your word? Father, I confess to you on behalf of everyone here, I don't have to ask them, I already know. I confess to you on behalf of every member of this community of faith, everyone watching on video, that we are all sinners. We all fall short. We all fail you. We all say and do what we shouldn't. We all say, uh, don't say and do what we should. Sometimes we sense your spirit leading us in one direction. We spin around, head off in the other direction. We have a sin problem. And that problem could separate us from you for all of eternity, except for that while we were yet sinners, you showed your love for us when you sent your only son to die on a cross, that he might pay our sin debt, that he might shed his blood for our guilt. What a thing. It's incredible. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the cross. Thank you, Father, that you look at us and you see us washed white as snow. In fact, you look at us and see your own son. It's maybe beyond our comprehension, but would you just help us to apprehend it? Lord, I lift up anyone in this room, anyone watching, who, who is uh, walking a guilty distance from you who's uh, struggling to make eye contact with you, looking at the relationship with you and realizing that it used to be better than it is today. Father, I pray that your spirit would just come rushing in on them now like a cool, refreshing waterfall, that they would recognize there was nothing they were ever going to say or do that was going to make you love them any more or love them any less. You're just patiently waiting in love for them to come back to you so that you can put them right back to work. And Father, if there's anybody here today, anybody listening who does not yet know you, who realizes in this moment they actually don't have a relationship with you, have not actually surrendered their life to you, so most of what I said made no sense to them because your Holy Spirit does not yet live inside them, would you give them another chance right here, right now today to respond to your knock on their heart's door that they might take the first step in a journey that lasts all of eternity. And surrender their life to you and accept Jesus as their Savior. Father, we love you. It's in the powerful name of Jesus that I pray. Amen. This is not a performance stage. There were some performances up here today. It was worship and it was beautiful. Um, but this is the altar of God. And I, I believe it's God's nature. He's always calling us from here to there. And I don't know what your here is or what your there is. But I think he's calling everybody here to do something, to respond in some way, to let go of something that you're holding tight on. Uh, you've got you know, just a tight grip on it and he wants you to let it go and you haven't done it yet. Or maybe he's calling you to step out in faith in some new area of ministry. Maybe he's calling you to get baptized and you haven't done that yet. I don't know what he's calling you to do, but I believe he's calling every one of us to something. Thing. And sometimes the best first step is to just take a step. And you can take a step and come up here and get on your knees at this altar. That might be one thing that you would do that would get the ball rolling on responding to God's call. I don't know what your, what your call is, but you're invited to respond. So that's what we call this song. We're going to sing the invitation. So stand if you're comfortable standing or assume a position of worship. And if God's calling you to get on your knees at this altar, do it. You're invited to do that. Let's sing together.